people should be peace loving. I think peace loving, irrespective of what our racial and religious backgrounds are. When you arrive in Kuala Lumpur for the first time, you can't help noticing that Malaysia deserves more attention from the outside world than it actually gets today. It is a modern and welcoming country with all the comforts and infrastructure of the Western world. A forward-looking attitude is immediately evident to the visitor. The city centre is dotted with huge artistically built skyscrapers. The roads are clean and well paved, most of the people speak English besides the native language and services are generally of Western standards. So the obvious question is, who are these Malaysians? How the name Malaysian appeared was, this country used to be known as Malaya. And when it used to be known as Malaya, we used to be known as Malayans. We got our independence on 31st December 1957 from the British. But the first Prime Minister, the Honourable Tunkoblu Raman, he invited Singapore, Sabah and Sarawak to join Malaya. And Greater Malaya became known as Malaysia. Subsequently, Singapore pulled out of the Malaysian Federation to become the booming economic city-state that it is today. The climate in Malaysia is equatorial and characterized by the annual southwest and northeast monsoons, and it generally rains all year round. An estimated 59% of the country's total size is still covered with forests. This is due to the government's sensitivity to environmental issues, a fact which has contributed to preserving the country's rich natural wealth. Today's population accounts for about 25 million people, a relatively small population for the size of the country. When you travel in Malaysia today, you realize the country is populated by many different races. Labels and street signs are often in Chinese, Indian, Arabic or English as well as Malay. Although most Malaysians dress in Western styles, several types of traditional dress are also worn. So what does it actually mean to be Malaysian? And where do all these different races come from? I think I, I would appreciate this term Malaysian. We have got the Malays. The Malays are the indigenous people of this country. Then we've got the Chinese. We've got the Indians. And of course, we've got Dayaks. We've got so many other races. And because all of us got together, uh, we call ourselves Malaysians. Malaysia today is actually a melting pot of many cultures and races of different origins. Over the last five centuries, the country has been a Portuguese colony, then Dutch, and then finally became part of the British Empire before acquiring independence. The reason why there are so many Indians and Chinese is mainly historical. During colonial times, the British imported the necessary labour force from India and China into Malaya, as it was called then. These people eventually created their own communities, and in almost every Malaysian city today, we still find a little India as well as a Chinatown. But other races, besides the Malays, are natives of the territory of Malaysia. They mainly still live a tribal life and dwell in the vast forests that still cover the country. One example of such people are the Negritos, who are of African origin. According to ethnologists, they may have moved from Africa as early as 15,000 years ago. 
This tribe has been given a special grant from the government to live and hunt inside the Taman Negara National Park. While these people's beliefs are still animistic, the Malays and other races that live in Malaysia today clearly have different religious beliefs depending on their historical and racial backgrounds. So how do the different religious groups live together today? We have freedom of worship. If you walk around, you go to every length and breadth of the country, you will find that we have got mosques, we've got churches, we've got temples, we've got different places of worship. Well, of course, uh, the, the, the main religion is uh, Islam, and most of the Malays, the indigenous people, uh, belong to Islam, the Muslims. Then we've got the Chinese. Among the Chinese, you have got Christians, you've got Buddhists, you've got free thinkers, and of course the Hindus and Hinduism. Though this is an Islamic country, the government has never gone against any religion. In fact, the government has always supported and even given grants to the various temples of worship. However, things were quite different in the past. A legacy of the British colonial system was the division of Malaysians in three groups according to ethnicity. The Chinese were concentrated in the cities, the Indians in the rubber and palm oil plantation areas, while the Malays lived in the rural areas. In the mid-1960s, still less than 2.5% of the corporate wealth in Malaysia was owned by Malays. For this reason, at the beginning of the 1970s, a new economic policy was introduced. This policy set a target whereby within 20 years, 30% of business ownership and admission to universities had to be set aside for the Bumiputras, the indigenous people of the country. This policy still persists in other programs. But how do non-Malays accept this controversial new economic policy? We are Indians having originated from India, we are the second generation of Indians. We have accepted it, we are continuing to accept it. Recently, questions are being asked as to how long this is going to continue. But I personally feel uh, it's all right. Malaysia has now been an independent country for over 50 years. The British colonialists surely left important infrastructure, such as the cross-country railway. But how has Malaysian economy developed since gaining independence? I must mention that uh, most of the development, most of the progress in Malaya and later Malaysia took place after our independence. For years, Malaysia's economy was based on tin mining, palm oil tree plantations and rubber tree plantations. At one time, Malaysia was the world's largest exporter of rubber and today is still the world's largest exporter of palm oil. During the 1970s, Malaysia committed itself to a transition from mining and agriculture to manufacturing. Heavy industries developed quickly and within a few years, Malaysian exports became the driving force of the country's economy. Nowadays, major products include electronic components such as semiconductor devices, electrical goods and appliances. A series of five-year economic plans with government intervention and investments led to developments of the economy, infrastructure and more recently tourism. The world-famous Petronas Towers of Kuala Lumpur and the skyscrapers that are the feature of every main city of the country are proof of this effort. Another clear example of the government's investment in infrastructure is the 14-kilometer-long bridge that links the island of Penang to the mainland. The main north-south highway is definitely of a very high standard. Malaysia also has its own brands and local production of cars and motorbikes. The tourist places, such as beach resorts and city centres, have seen significant investment into facilities aimed at improving the tourists' holiday experience. 
Lots of small and middle-sized islands surround Peninsula Malaysia and Borneo, where you can find beautiful tropical beaches and coral reefs, as well as wild, mountainous and rocky landscapes. These places are perfect tourist destinations, and the government has invested in the environmentally sustainable development of these small paradises. We have a mission. We have a mission 2020. Uh, which means by the year 2020 we want to be a fully developed country. But despite its quick and massive economic development, Malaysia still preserves traditional elements such as its old markets and villages, which clearly show its strong Asian heritage. With its economic development over the last 40 years, Malaysia has definitely set an example for all the neighbouring countries as to how progress can be achieved through key investments into specific sectors such as infrastructure and manufacturing. These consequently boost international trading and national wealth. You can compare with other Southeast Asian countries, I think we stand up as one of the best. Besides economic progress, another key factor of Malaysia's fast development is its internal stability, which stems from the mainly peaceful coexistence of so many different races and religions. Lately, interracial marriages have become commonplace, creating even stronger bonds among the people of Malaysia and setting a further example of reciprocal respect understanding and friendship for the whole world to look at and try to follow. We can tell the rest of the world we've never had much of riots, we've never had much of internal problems. Uh, I think basically we are very broad-minded people and uh, we think as Malaysians, of course there are exceptions, but um, we have survived 50 years and for us to continue surviving, we've always got to think as ourselves as one nation. But does the world today have the same positive attitude of tolerance and peacefulness that Malaysia has built over the years? You see, so much of money, so much of resources are going down because every part of the world, every day, there is a war. There's so much of wasted money going down for the defense of the country. And you've got millions of people who are starving, who don't even have a daily meal, lack of nutrition. Well, I think, as I said, it's a, it's a beautiful country. I think we are a beautiful country. We are a very friendly country. We have tried to inculcate the best values of our rich cultures and traditions. Maybe because of that, we have done well. Again, because we are a multiracial, multi-religious country, we have lived together, we have grown up together, and that's one of the reasons why we have been living in harmony over the years. I think it's a glaring example, it's an example that the rest of the world must uh, uh, pick up.